Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is January 28th, 2021. Today I am going to bring what I consider to be a very grievous word. It's um, <clears throat> a word that is weighing very heavily on my heart. And um, I'm sure many people who listen to this are wondering what in the world is going on these days. I still believe that Donald Trump will be declared president of the United States. And it has to do with so much that has become obvious to people in the four years that Donald Trump was president. The horrors, the evil of the world were greater than I ever imagined, and I'm sure you feel the same. In fact, it's it's hard for me to even imagine these things existing in the world that have been revealed to us. The things of Jeffrey Epstein's island, uh, adrenochrome, satanic ritual abuse, child sacrifice, child sex trafficking, and on and on. The thing that is so grievous to me right now is that there are a multitude of people who are coming forth in support of Donald Trump. And I support Donald Trump. I still support him. I believe that he is God's instrument to judge evil, to judge the deep state cabal that I call Babylon the Great, revealed in Revelation chapters 17 and 18. But many people besides Christians have supported Donald Trump and still support him. And a lot of those people are New Age believers. And I'm concerned that a lot of them will be able to deceive Christians. But what's new? You know, think about it. Christians have been deceived for 2,000 years. What greater, what greater deception was there than convincing Christians to celebrate Ishtar, Easter, a pagan deity. Easter. Christians celebrate Easter, and what, what is the food that they always have? Ham. What are they supposed to be celebrating? They're supposed to be celebrating Passover. Passover, the time when the Lamb of God was sacrificed for the sin of man. And the church, all churches, Virtually, all churches, Catholic and Protestant, celebrate Easter even to this day. So they celebrate the pagan goddess Ishtar, not Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for our sins. One of these New Age prophets recently said something really that was very astute. It was something that someone else had said to him. He said, celebrating Easter, we should think of celebrating Easter as to Jesus, what it would be like if Lee Harvey Oswald came to a Kennedy party or celebration. Remember, he was the one who they say assassinated John F. Kennedy. So the point is that Jesus would not be pleased for us celebrating his supreme sacrifice at the time of a pagan holiday. And so Christians have been deceived for 2,000 years. 
And so now here we are at the end of the age where the culmination of things that God has prophesied through his prophets is coming to pass. And many people see it, Christians and non-Christians, Christians and New Agers, Christians, New Agers, and total unbelievers in anything religious. They see that Donald Trump is doing a good thing. And the New Agers now, some of them are teaching ways to achieve what they call the Christ consciousness. I've heard one of them say that Donald Trump has a Christed spirit within him. Others are teaching ways... So here we are now at the time when Christians, leaders have lied to them about truth, about the doctrines of Scripture, even about such basic things as Easter. They should have been celebrating Passover the entire time. And there's so many other things, so many um, ways that the church has uh, not followed the ways of God. And they've, you, you have churches, even some churches involved in the um, child trafficking, the sex trafficking, um, and then the ritual abuse. It's just, uh, it's really beyond comprehension, really where we are as a world and as a people. And so you have now new age teachers who are, who are actually teaching a word of righteousness, or are actually saying things that um, we need to be righteous people. We need to live righteously. We need to love each other. We need to be all about love. You know, they're getting a lot right. And they're saying a lot of true things. And, and I commend them for that. Um, so I do not want to uh, offend them with this video and um, make them think that I'm just blasting them because I'm not. You know, I, I am happy that someone is preaching righteousness. Even the law. Some of them are even going to the law of God and talking about the law being written upon their minds. And that's exactly what the scripture says the new covenant is all about, is the law of God being written upon our minds. So that we would want to do them. So that we would want to do the righteous acts of God. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. We need to be grounded in the word. Let's start with 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And then we also have this um, scripture from 2 John, where John says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. The real stumbling stone 
is who is Jesus Christ or who was Jesus Christ. And this is something that we see in the Bible quite a few times. In Isaiah chapter 8, he says this, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he, that is the Lord of hosts, will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many will stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken, and they shall be snared and taken. So I'm today talking about this rock of stumbling. What is this rock of stumbling? Let's keep reading here. Many people stop at the end of chapter 8 and don't go on right into chapter 9, but we're going to continue in 8. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law. That word teaching there is law among my disciples. The testimony is the written word of God that testifies to God's acts in history. The law is given in the testimony. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. You know, so many are witches today, witches, warlocks everywhere. Everyone is channeling spirits. And we have to be so careful that we don't, that we don't begin to do that. We cannot fall into the deception of wanting to hear voices and then fall for the voices that are demonic spirits speaking. So when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. It is because they have no light. We live in a day of incredible darkness. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against the king, against their king and their God, and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom. For who, her who was in anguish, who is that? That is the woman of Revelation chapter 12. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of dark, deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his, for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tromping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now we know through the prophecies in the New Testament, that this child that was born was Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it 
and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This prophecy is not just limited to Jesus, but it is fulfilled in Jesus. And it is Jesus who is the stumbling stone. Why is he the stumbling stone? Go to Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Notice this begins with saying that God in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. He, his Son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That is, he is fully in God's image. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus Christ, Jesus the man, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That sums it up, but we're going to go and we're going to look at scriptures that detail this. But before we do that, let's look at a couple of uh, a couple of other scriptures. Romans 9. What shall we say then, that, that Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus is a rock of offense. He is a stumbling stone. Why? Why? Because you have to go to him to make it. You have to go to him and depend upon him in order to ever enter Zion, the new Jerusalem, in order to achieve immortality, in order to achieve eternal life. These days, we have the New Age prophets who are just saying, if you do these things, and they have a lot of things to do. One of the things I've recently heard is that if you will become a, something like a fruitarian or something, someone who only eats fruit, then because you're eating living organism, which is the living fruit, then your body will not die. Well, I don't believe that. Or if you will somehow cleanse your pineal gland, you will be able to see God clearly and be able to commune with God clearly. But it, whatever it is, you have to do certain things to get there. Well, isn't that exactly what Paul is preaching against here? And isn't that what he was preaching against to the Galatians when the Galatians wanted to get circumcised? In Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith, in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. In other words, for you Christians, 
You know, you, you're seeking God. You're, you're wanting to be righteous as Jesus is righteous. But yet, you still sin. You still committed a sin. So Paul says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. The law is relevant. The law is important. And we should live according to the law. But if we fail, we still are living toward God. And Christ makes intercession for us. Yes, we need to repent and get on with it. But we need to keep, keep on going. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See, that's it. How did you begin? How did you begin your walk? Well, I know for me, the Spirit convicted me of sin. And because of that overpowering conviction, I realized that I was a sinner and I repented of my sin. And God gave me the grace to not continue walking in it. I began with the Spirit. Am I perfect yet? No, I'm not. Do I want to be? Yes, I do. And I really believe that that, that that one aspect is perhaps the defining aspect of the one that God says is an overcomer. The one who wants to be like Christ and knows that he can't be without Jesus Christ himself. So the stumbling stone, the stumbling stone is Jesus because that means if you look to Jesus, it means you can't do it. You are not, you are not good enough. You are not powerful enough. You are not strong enough to do it on your own. You cannot be perfect on your own. You cannot ascend by your own power. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that there will come a change for us in the twinkling of an eye when mortality puts on immortality. Now, why do people stumble over Christ? I think it's because they believe that Christ is a mere man. So let's continue looking at Hebrews chapter 1. Remember the introduction to Hebrews 1, how powerfully he spoke of Christ. Now, I believe Apollos is the writer of Hebrews and not Paul, but it may not have been Apollos either, but I don't think it was Paul because it doesn't sound like Paul to me. Verse 5. What, what this writer is going to do now is to take us to Old Testament scriptures Now, why would he do that? Just occurred to me, let's go to um, Luke. I believe. 
believe it's 24. Let's see. Luke 24. Now, Luke 24 is about the resurrection, okay? That very day, well, this is on the first day of the week. Okay, so this would have been on Sunday. At early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Jesus was alive. He was not dead. Jesus rose from the dead. He didn't just die showing men how to be a good man. He died and was resurrected from the dead. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Even the apostles did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he, the man walking with them, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
So they drew near to the village in which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Oh, God. Please open your scriptures to us that we may believe. <laughs> Give us faith, O oh Lord. The days are dark, and we long for your presence, God. We long for your presence, Jesus. Deliver us from deception. Deliver us from evil. In your name we pray. Amen.